which are Genesis chapter 17, verses 1 to 8. Tonight, I want to share with you on the topic, the promise is still on schedule. And so I wonder tonight if there's anyone here who has been promised some things that you never received. I think of various kinds of promises. I think of promises like employment promises. There are persons who have been promised various kinds of jobs or positions in, in a certain kind of employment. And you go there, you labor, you work for years, but that promise never came to fruition. It was never offered to you. I think also of political promises. I guess many of us are very familiar with that, right? If you vote for me, this is what I will do for you and your community, and you cast your vote. But the promise never happened. I think of promises like business promises. People who decide that if you partner with them, they will give you their commitment to the business. They will pull their weight in all of this and you partnered with them or allow them to partner with you, but it never happened. The promise is never kept. I think of financial promises. Some of the investments that we were told to make or invited to make, and we we're promised a certain kind of returns on it or that the returns will look like a particular thing, but it never happened. I think of relational and familial promises from husbands to wives, wives to husbands, parents to children, children to parents, friends to friends, and somewhere along the way, it just never happened. And this can be very hard. It is hard to be in any of these situations, especially when you find yourself on the receiving end of the broken promise. And so when Abraham was 75 years old, Genesis 12 verses 1 to 4 tells us that God told him to leave his country and his people and to go to a land that he would show him. Now, God told Abraham that he would bless him and that he would make him a great nation and that he would make his name great. And 10 years later, Abram's wife, Sarai, was still barren and she bore him no children. And so Sarai gave her handmaid, Hagar, to Abram to sleep with her so that he could get a family through Hagar because Sarai was trying to fulfill God's promise through her, through Hagar. Now, when Hagar realized that she was pregnant, she looked down on Sarai, her mistress. She was now full of it. And Sarai was distressed by that. And of course, that started problems in Abraham's household. And Sarai became abusive to Hagar that Hagar had to run away. And Genesis 16, 6 tells us that Abram was 86 years old when Hagar's son Ishmael was born. Waiting on the promise is hard. We can mess up and lose hope in the process of waiting. 13 years later, after the boy Ishmael was born, if we were to calculate it, it would have been 24 years after God promised Abraham. Abraham at the time. After, it was after that, after the boy was 13, that the Lord appeared to Abraham and identified himself to him. Now, I think of the times we live in and how everyone wants to self-identify, to protect our images. We sit in meetings, we're having conferences, we're in various social settings, 
And each person, many times as we introduce ourselves, we're asked to identify ourselves or pronouns or job titles, what we do, who we are. We self-identify to protect our images. Yet God appeared to Abraham and identified himself and it was to protect Abram from himself. Abram received the promise of God in chapter 12. And I want you to follow me here a little bit. Verses 1 to 4 tells us, and by chapter 15, Abram was here confronting God about how he's childless. And he told God that Eliezer of Damascus, who was a steward at the time, that Eliezer would inherit his legacy and become heir in his house. And God told Abraham then in verse four of chapter 15, that that would not be his portion. God took him forth outside and showed him the heavens. And the Lord promised him, he said, look up at the stars. He says, your seed will be as numberless as the stars in the heaven. And here what the text says, that Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now years passed and nothing happened. So Sarai, his wife, decided to help God out a little bit. And I know that some of us like to help God out, just like Sarai. You know, God's not coming through fast enough. So we decide to help him out and get ourselves in all kinds of mess. And what a blessing that God can still use the mess that we bring sometimes right back to him. And we have some well-intentioned people in our lives, but they can divert us from what God already told us. And I want to say that to somebody's spirit tonight, that there are some well-intentioned people around you in your life, but they can divert you from what God already told you and promised you. And so after Sarai's failed attempt to help God out, God appeared to Abraham. In his identification, God came to assess and inspect Abraham's capacity. He said, this is what he said to Abraham, I. Now notice, not Sarai, not Hagar, not any of those people around us with lots to say, I am God Almighty. I am the Almighty God, the El Shaddai. The God who shows himself mighty. The God who operates like a volcanic eruption the original meaning brings in the word El Shaddai. The self-sufficient God. The more than enough God. I am that God. What a way for God to identify himself to his servant. He said, I told you 24 years ago. And because Abram did not see it happen, because Sarah became wary that God's not coming through on time. Here's God 24 years later at 99 years old, Abram was. And God said to him, I am El Shaddai. I am the almighty God. I am the God who is self-sufficient. I am the God who can act without anyone's help. My friends, this is the God who will confront you when he's given you a promise and has spoken something to you. But the waiting process becomes too difficult for you. In that identification, God gave Abraham an instruction. And the Lord said to him, walk before me. Like Enoch walked with God and the scripture says until he was not. Walking in the will of God, even when it looks contrary to the logics of man and that of science. Walk before me and be thou blameless, be thou perfect. Walk before me completely. Walk before me with 
all of who you are. It must come in complete alignment to believe in all of who I am. That is the person who appeared to Abraham, the El Shaddai God, the all-sufficient God. He says, walk before me, not half-heartedly, not one foot in and one foot out, not choosing today to serve and tomorrow you are out of this. Walk before me completely. Walk before me because you believe in who I am. It is no wonder the man said to Jesus, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. When the beat of the drum changes, walk before him completely. When everything seemed to be going haywire, walk before him completely. Keep on walking. Even when others are talking, keep on walking before him. When all hell breaks loose around you, walk before him completely in your faith. Believing that he who hath begun a good work in you will complete it. He will perform it. He will perfect it. He says, walk before me. The same pattern of walk that Enoch did before God, completely believing him. And so God appeared identifying himself and instructing Abraham. But what was more was as we move into verse two, look at God's intervention in what he told Abraham. He says, this is how I come in into this relationship with you. I will make my covenant between me and you. This is between you and God. This promise that God has given you is between you and the almighty God. This covenant is an alliance. This covenant is a treaty. It's a pledge. It's an obligation. It's a contract between you and the divine. When God gives you an instruction, you don't need to form an alliance or get a contract or get any approval or any signature with anyone for this to happen. That's why God identified himself as El Shaddai. I can do this, this too, all by myself. I am the more than sufficient one. I am the El Shaddai God. Hear me somebody. And I want you to understand tonight in this space that the Hebrew expression for this very word El Shaddai literally expresses the many breasted one, the multi breasted one. When God comes into a contract with any believer, with anyone who comes to him, God says to him, God says to them, as he said to Abraham, I am the multi breasted one one. Oh my God, if we were to say this probably in the Jamaican vernacular, he would say, I am the God with no titty. I am the God with lots. I have many breasts. That's the literal Hebrew translation of this word. God has enough to feed his own. He has enough for his people. He lacks nothing that you need. He is the God who is many breasted who is the multi-breasted one, the all-sufficient God. He says to Abraham, I will multiply you greatly. I will give to you a huge family. I, the many-breasted, the God who has overflow, the God who has more than enough, the God in whom there is no lack, the God who has sufficiency in all things in himself, the God who doesn't need man to act, the God who doesn't need a crowd, the God who is able to do for you far more abundantly above all that you could ask or imagine. He says, I will multiply you greatly. 
the God of magnitude. Abraham was so overwhelmed by this magnitude of God's awesomeness that the text says he fell flat on his face and God got him there to talk with him. When last have you fallen flat on your face, overcome by the power of the magnanimous God that we serve? How long has it been since God has just brought his presence in your space that you are awestruck by who he is? Abram fell flat on his face before El Shaddai God. What have I done? He probably was wondering. What have I been thinking? He probably had in his mind. Why have I not believed everything that he said? Because he is the El Shaddai God. What a gracious God. What a gracious God that despite his lack, God appeared before him in identification, instruction, and intervention. Hear what God says to him. As for me, Abraham, my covenant is with you and you shall be a father of many nations. He's not coming to take back from you that which is, he promised you. The promises of God, the gifts of God are irrevocable. The gifts of God are without repentance. When God promises you, when he gives to you, he doesn't come to snatch it back. He's not coming just to wait on you around the corner for you to slip up with the Hagar in your life for him to say, aha, uh -huh, I caught you. God is so gracious. He is the magnanimous God in all lives, the forgiven God, the God who comes with all of his grace. And he says, here is my deal. This is my covenant with you. I promise you this. And as far as I'm concerned, we have a contract. And you, Abraham, shall be the father of many nations. Wow. As far as I'm concerned, the promise is still on schedule. He says, I'll make it even more official. Your name shall no longer be Abraham. Hear me, somebody, that God's promise to you is still on schedule. You haven't skipped a beat just because something gets in the way, just because the Sarahs in your life decided to make their own decision and move things along the trajectory in their way and on their terms and on according to their plans. God's promise for you is still on schedule. You are still on time for where God is bringing you. Don't become impatient with what God's doing in your life. There is a work in progress that's going on and the promise is still on schedule. He says, I'm going to make it official. I'm changing your name from Abraham. Now, Abraham already means exalted father. And God says it will now be Abraham, which means father of a multitude. Father of of many nations, father of, 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 of seed, of children who will be like the sand on the seashore. God is able in whatever sphere of your life that you are, he's able to rearrange your destinies. He's able to bring you into alignment with what he already has promised you and spoken over you. He is the God of multiplication. He is the God who gives exceedingly greatly. He is the God who he says, I will make thee exceeding fruitful. I will give to you in abundance. He is the God who does not subtract unless the subtraction is that which he needs to remove from you to give you the multiplication because he's the God of excess. He says to Abraham, nations shall come out of you. My God, what God has promised you, what he spoke over you, nations will come out of you. There will be births coming out of you. It's not just biological. Oh, God Almighty, God is going to birth in you some vision and businesses and things that you've never 
dreamed of and things that you never thought you were capable of because he wants to bring you in that place where you understand and grasp and walk in his promise for you. The promise is still on schedule. You feel like it's been delayed 15 years. Oh, some of you feel like it's been 30 years. Well, guess what? Uh, Sarai felt the same way. Abram felt the same way, obviously. He didn't resist when Sarai gave him her handmaid, Hagar. He felt maybe, yeah, if we agree on this, that we can help God out with this thing. But God says, that's not your portion because that which I promised you shall come to you. I don't know what you are going through. I don't know your doubts and your fears and your concerns in this moment, but I know that somebody right here tonight, you are believing that God has forgotten you. You're believing that God has forsaken you. You believe and you've come in the space thinking that God has just up and left you and you're wondering, oh my God, where are you? You promised me this 30 years ago, 20 years ago, 17 years ago, but you are in the right space tonight. Because God's promise is still on schedule for you. Doesn't matter how many Hagar's come in between this promise. It doesn't matter how many Ishmael's are born over this time of God's promise. God's promise for you are yes and amen. And he says, I will make you exceedingly fruitful. And nations shall come out of you. Oh God, there are some, there are some things that are yet to be born out of you and they are not dead. As long as you are here, God still has a contract and a covenant with you and he's a covenant keeping God and he will keep his side of the bargain. I wonder about you. I wonder about you. I pray tonight that as this word finds space and, pl and place in your heart, that like Abraham, God will throw you flat on your face and you will recognize El Shaddai God spoke to you and it must come to pass. He says, I will perfect that which concerns you. The psalmist right in Psalm 138, 8, I will perfect that which concerns you. That's his promise. He says to Abraham, kings shall come out of you. But this is after he changed his status. You see, God had to bring Abraham to a place where he had to create a change. He said, you don't get it. You don't get that you're not just an exalted father. I am going to make you a father of multitudes, nations, kings, and princes. Oh, you are going to inhabit the earth. You are going to have lands and, and establish yourself all over the world with nations coming from you. There is an impact that God already promised you about your life. And he's not done with you. He's not done with you. You're just going through your period of waiting, your 24 years of waiting. The man was 75. He was 99 in this chapter. And God says to him, kings shall come out of you, out of a 99 year old and you think that you are too old. You think because you're six to five, you think because you're 70 that you're too old to do what God has in store for you or you're too old for God to do anything with you, hear me. God said to Abraham, kings shall come from you. I will multiply you, a 99 year old man, my God in heaven. God said to him right now where you are camping, even the very place that you're coaching, in the very place where you've set up your tent, the temporary place that you are, I'm going to give it to you and your descendants. So where you are right now is temporary. But God promises that what he has for you will come to pass and he will bring you into permanence. You see, some of the places where you are right now, some of the things you're encountering, some of the places where you are and feeling like you're a stranger, God says, even those places I will give to you to inherit. What a promise of God. The promise, the promise, the promise is still on schedule. It is not on your timing. It is not according to your 
situation. It is not according to what you feel about it. It is not according to what you think it should be. It is about what Almighty God says of you. And he says, I have promised you. And as far as I know, my covenant is still with you. Everything I promise you is still on schedule. Everything I spoke over you is still on schedule. Every promise I've ever made to you, every prophecy that ever came to you, it is still on schedule. Your current situation doesn't look like it because you're squatting. That's what it was for, for Abraham. That's what it was. They were squatting on the land of the Canaanites. They were strangers. They had set up camp there, passing through. And God says, even there, in what seemed to be a temporary place, that I, 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 God, the El Shaddai God, the multi-breasted God, the God who is more than sufficient, the God who is so self-sufficient, I will make it your habitation. I will give it to you and your descendants forever. So tonight, right where you are, reflecting and feeling like God has forgotten you, I said that is a lie from the pit of hell. That's the enemy's lie to you so that you will lose your faith. He comes to steal, to kill, to destroy. He wants to rip you and strip you. And he wants to, to just totally uh, uh, crush you. He wants to destroy everything of God in you. And so he speaks the lies over you. For the word of God to you tonight is that the promise of God for you is still on schedule. God hasn't skipped a beat because you messed up. God hasn't skipped a beat because some Hagar came in between. God hasn't skipped a beat because the mistress Sarah felt like she needed to help God out. God's plans for you are yes and amen. He says, I know the plans I have for you. They are plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope, a lively hope and a future. That's his plans for you. The God who multiplies, the God who gives and gives and his resources can never run dry because he's El Shaddai, the multi-breasted one. He has enough. He lacks nothing, everything you need. He can and will supply. Is it always on your schedule? No, it's never on your schedule, but he's an on-time God. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. And so he comes tonight, right in the space, right here in the space to tell you he has not forgotten you. He's not forsaken you. He has not forgotten the promises he made to your grandfather about you, your grandmother about you, your forefathers. He has not forgotten. And he wants you to know that tonight, his promise for you is still on schedule. So right where you are, I'm going to invite you to bow your head with me in this space, with me as we reflect on this word of God, with me because the word of God, like, you know, it is yes, it is amen. It has to come to pass. It cannot return to him void. And so right where you are in that doubting space of your heart, in that dark space, in that unbelief, I invite you to just bow your heart, that same heart, that same space, that same place that is concerned and wondering if God is still there. He saw Hagar when she ran away from Sarai and he provided for her and Ishmael even in the wilderness. He will do the same for you because he's already promised you. So Father, we come tonight thanking you for your word, thanking you for your promise, thanking you, God Almighty, that you cannot lie, thanking you that you're a God who keeps your promises, thanking you that your words cannot return to you void, thanking you that whoever comes to you must believe that you are, that you exist that you are everything that you say that you are and will be. And we believe tonight, Lord, help thou or unbelief. We commit to you every doubt in our heart, every fear, 
every period of uncertainty, every loss, every pain, everything that interrupted God, the seed that we felt was right on schedule. And we pray that you would help us to see even beyond the logics of our situation that you are still on schedule with everything that you promised us. So we offer on this altar tonight, every doubt, every fear, every heartache, every disappointment, disillusionment. We commit to you everyone who's ever broken their promises to us. We commit to you everything, every situation, every everything in our history or past that has made us fear and believe that you are not able because we've not had people who've come through for us and it becomes difficult to believe you. We commit that to Lord. We commit that to. And we ask in this moment that through your grace, you would teach us how to trust you, how to believe, how to trust and obey. For there is only one way. This is the only way to be happy in Jesus, to trust you and to obey. Would you help our unbelief, God? And would you cause, God, that this grace, your mercy, that's given to us, not because we are worthy, but because you are gracious, because you are the mighty God. You are the God who, who continues to look beyond our faults and you see the need in the inner recesses of our being, our lack, that we are nothing without you, that we've already failed without you, that you would look beyond our small minds and our fearful hearts and our doubting spirits. And would you, God, restore within us the faith to believe, for all things are possible if we only believe. We say we will believe you for it tonight, Lord. We will believe you for the healing in our hearts, the healing in our lives, the healing in our families, the healing in our souls, the healing in the bitter hearts that we bring to you. We will believe you for it, Father, for we look to you and your words to us are yes and amen. Your promises, your goodness continues to chase after us, Father. And so we receive of you tonight and we believe you for it and we call it done in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.